Hi, this video is clips from a recent conversation I had on genetics testing, and especially on testing for MTHFR gene mutations. We discuss things like when tests are helpful, the problems with testing, how I suggest we approach testing instead, and even touch on the future of genetic testing. I hope you find it helpful. Testing, is it necessary? or not? It's a great question and I would say if someone sends me uh, a test result I can use it to kind of get an idea and sort of gauge what level of severity their gene mutation could be expressing at. So for example if they have a double mutation, if they have a compound heterozygous 1677, 11298, um, if they have a double 677, if they have a double 1298. I know a few general things, and so the testing can help kind of guide me in a direction. Um, meaning, if someone tells me they have a double 677, I immediately think to myself, oh, they probably should be tested for homocysteine to see if their homocysteine levels are high. Some, for some reason, 677 seems to track more in the studies with uh, high homocysteine levels. So I almost always, when I see 677, think probably someone should have homocysteine levels tested. If you've already had homocysteine levels tested and you already know they're high, do you need to know your MTHFR? You know, maybe, maybe not, right? Um, so... So it's a, it's a really good question in terms of what type of testing is necessary. Genetics can be helpful, but symptoms and other uh, types of tests can also tell similar things. And also experimenting with the nutrients. So I have a lot of people that kind of come to the site and, oh, well, you know, I'll order once I get tested. And, um, you know, I'm not trying to push people into buying our products. That's definitely not the thing. But the reality is, is the doctors and specifically Dr. Rollins will be like, I don't need to test people when I understand that they're depressed and their homocysteine levels come back high. I am pretty darn sure they have MTHFR and they probably need methylfolate and NAC probably need some type of a B12 and, you know, maybe they also need some P5P if they tolerate it. So in his mind, he knows enough about how MTHFR works to be able to figure in the symptoms and the uh, other test results that he finds to be able to suggest, hey, these nutrients would probably do you good and you probably have this mutation. Is it sometimes helpful for people to have peace of mind and so they get testing? I'm, I tend to be one of those people where I want a whole lot more information than maybe I really need. Uh, so I love the tests because they kind of help. And at the same time, I have one of the mildest uh, MTHFR mutations. In fact, if a doctor uh, looked at my test result, I have a single 1298. They would be like, oh, well, you don't have issues with MTHFR. And yet, when I took methylfolate, that absolutely changed my life. And it's because I have a number of other MTHFR mutations, kind of under the covers, right, that uh, are not as well known, they're not as well studied, and so they don't ever get tested unless you're doing a whole genome sequence or you're doing a very specific uh, DNA test where they're gathering a lot more of those MTHFR SNPs and, and you see you have more than just, you know, the well-known ones. So a doctor would have dismissed me if I would have gone and gotten a blood test for MTHFR because they would have checked to see if I had 677. Nope, you don't. Uh, 1298, nope, you don't. They would have tested my homocysteine levels. Nope, you don't have high homocysteine. You're fine. MTHFR doesn't affect you. And when I took methylfolate, absolutely game-changing, life-changer for me. And I just show as having a single MTHFR mutation. So why is that, right? I've got other SNPs. There's other things. So I started experimenting with 
the methylfolate um, when my test result came back. Now that was back in 2011. There wasn't anybody to say, oh, is this important or not important? Nobody knew anything about it. So Dr. Easter tested me. She said, Dr. Rollins knows all this great stuff about MTHFR. You have it. Why don't you consider taking some of the nutrients? But today, the doctors would tell you, oh, 1298 really is nothing, and you only have one mutation so or a single, so it's not important. Um, so testing does not tell the whole story. I think for a lot of people, trying the nutrients and starting with them at a very low level and slowly increasing to see if mid-level or higher level or to see if mid-level or higher level dosing or dosages help them. Um, I didn't really know it at the time, but depression was probably the factor for me. Um, I didn't consider myself like, you know, clinically depressed, and I certainly wasn't diagnosed that way, but I, I definitely had IBS, which is indicative of low serotonin levels, and I definitely, when my serotonin levels were tested, they showed significantly below normal. And, you know, my zest for life was and, and desire to just feel great about it and having all kinds of energy was very low. My energy levels were low. Um, I had you know, kind of borderline anemia on a clinical test. A doctor would not have called that uh, anemic. If more in a naturopathic optimal range, they would have definitely said, oh yeah, you're low on these, you know, so you probably need some B12. Uh, so the combination of the two for me, the methylfolate and the B12s, really, really changed my life and turned the dial. Uh, but if I went by test alone, it wouldn't, you know, I don't think doctors would have said this is important for you. So testing to me, we don't talk about it very much because to me there's so much nuance around it, right? A lot of people really want it because it helps them feel better about, oh, I have a real diagnosis. So now I'm, you know, can take something that will help cure me or help me get better. If that helps you and you have access to a test and you have money and you want to do that, do it, right? I mean, I, I think people should do what makes them feel comfortable. For me, knowing that I had MTHFR, oh, I felt really, oh, yay, I'm validated, something, you know, and it also explained really clearly why the methylfolate worked for me. And also, if sometimes a test can take a long time to get back, sometimes they're expensive, sometimes the doctors don't know how to read them, sometimes doctors will dismiss the results as not important because maybe they're not um, as well versed in the studies and the information. So you have to decide if that test is valuable or not. If you say to yourself, you know what, I'm just gonna try the nutrients. If they work for me, they work. And if they're working and I'm feeling better and my numbers for high homocysteine are going low, my numbers for low serotonin are boosting up, you know, maybe, maybe that's significant. And maybe I need these nutrients because I have, you know, kind of a deficiency or I have a less than optimal amount. In Western medicine, it's pretty hard to get tested as having a deficiency. I wasn't deficient in B12, in folate. I wasn't deficient in anemia. I wasn't deficient. Yeah, I mean, like, I didn't hit any threshold of any kind to have a doctor say, oh, hey, this is important for you. You need this, right? When I went to a naturopath and they're like, well, here's kind of the optimum window, window for that, and I'm way outside of that, or I'm lower than that, and then we try, you know, so to me, that's deficient, but it's not classified as deficient by Western medicine. So um, when do I think testing is necessary? Necessary is an extreme word. I would say it can be helpful when you're really trying to chase down some more nuanced problems or you've been to a lot of different doctors and they don't have answers for you and you're trying to figure out where to go next. And finding um, a genetic uh, natural doctor that cares about and is looking at nutrition um, and how to dial in nutrients to help your deficiencies, those are really, really hard to find and few and far between. And I um, was recommending one and I've recently seen communication that from a customer that he's no longer taking patients and they're trying to get more people trained. Uh, but it's, it's just a very uh, in-depth field that not a lot of people 
we're looking at, because there's not a lot of money there, right? I mean, there's a lot of genetics in the drug world because if you're building drugs, right, there's a lot of money around drugs. When you're talking about vitamins, there's not a lot of people investing a lot of money in vitamin research because people can't make money out of uh, people buying vitamins. The, the uh, profit margin on vitamins is very, very low. So, um, so it's hard to find a good test. Well, I shouldn't say it's hard to find a good test. It's hard to find a good resource that knows how to read all of the tests and understands the, the biology and the biopathways and how they all affect each other. Because you can get tested and everybody is able to go grab a test kit and then run it through some automated program that somebody has tried to kind of pair nutrients to genes with. And I've done a lot of those. And most of the pairings just don't work um, because we're trying to, you know, look at it in a really binary way. Well, if you have this gene, you need this nutrient. Well, if you have this gene, you need that nutrient. And it is not that binary. We have massive pathways with massive, you know, genes that are doing, each of them doing such different things that you know you and I can have the exact same gene mutation and we can both respond absolutely opposite to a nutrient that somebody thinks we should be taking for that gene mutation and the the biggest challenge that I've found in this field is I don't think there's very many people that know um, the doctors uh, really again because there are not there's not money to be had in the study of nutrients and vitamins and diet, right, or how nutrients affect our health. Um, you don't have lots of people diving into this field to learn more. There are a few people here and there, but the amount that they know, I mean, a lot of times people focus on a very small area where they know a few things here and there, but the, the number of people that have a breadth is really, like, I just haven't been, and that's why we don't recommend any particular test. I don't really have one to send people to. Dr. Amy Yasko does a great job on the methylation pathway. She very specifically specializes in uh, folks on the autistic spe spectrum, and she targets uh, children on the autism spectrum. And so all of her products and testing and information that she gives out to people are really based on that niche, um, which is kind of a, a multi-prong uh, genetic challenge, right? Because it's uh, this autism spectrum is is a a handful of genes that are doing things in different ways, and so even just that small number of genes, like I don't know, I think she's eighteen or uh, or so ish genes. I mean, she's been doing that for. 20 years or more, like way before I was doing it in 2011. And that still is a massive, I think, learning curve where she's trying to, to give people information. And that's just this really tiny, you know, narrow niche that she's looking in. Um, but if you want help with that niche, that's a great place to go looking, right? If you have uh, kids on the spectrum, if you're on the spectrum, if you know people that are interested in, in being tested and they're on the spectrum, she is a good resource for that specifically. But she narrows down into this really tiny niche, right? And so people that know broad areas, they're, they're just not out there that I've found. Um, so, and I keep looking and if other people find them, send them our way. We would love to continue to kind of dive into and vet uh, various, you know, resources so that we have places to send people to because that's what we want to do at the end of the day. I just think we're so new in this curve of we're finding out about genetics, but we don't know the full ramification of how to, to solve or address. I mean, genetics is, is relatively new. The whole genome sequence project it, I mean, we're only 20 years or so out from that. It's, we are not very far along. And so 
understanding the ramifications of something, I mean, just because you know you have something, we, we don't have a lot of those um, solutions in place yet. And so the way that Dr. Rollins talks about it as, uh, he calls it uh, metabolomics, which is, um, and apparently there are a few military grade machines in the US that can actually do this, but uh, when you take a blood sample, it can basically read all of the metabolites in the body and then kind of be able to adjust and understand which metabolites are in or out of balance. And so it's this uh, highly precise, really extreme, um, running just crazy amounts of calculations in order to, I mean, like weeks at a time calculations before you get a test result. Um, so very fascinating. And Dr. Rollins really feels like when we understand more about and we are testing metabolomics, we're going to know more because just getting a genetic test gives us information about what our genes might be doing or might not be doing. It doesn't tell us what the body is actually doing. And so that's sort of therein lies the epigenetic, um, right? You can have a gene mutation, but it may not necessarily be expressing. So if it's not expressing, if you had a map of the uh, metabolomics, right, where you could see all of the metabolites, you could probably map that to a gene and say, oh, this gene is expressing and is causing problems. And then the question is, when do we start getting solutions for when certain metabolites are off, right? How do we start correcting for that? Um, so those, those kinds of things, I think he hopes come down the pike, you know, uh, but th those are probably decades away. Um, and so that's why, again, I go back to how valuable is genetic testing. It can give us some information. It is not, uh, you know, the, the silver arrow, the silver bullet that, that, you know, hits everything we need. It's some bit of information that we can take with us. And I think at the end of the day, one of the big things that, I don't think we give ourselves enough credit for that we really should try to do more of, and I'm trying to learn how to do this myself because I was never taught this, but is really to check in and pay attention and try to be intuitive with my own understanding of my body and how I feel and what I think I might be needing or not needing in terms of nutrients, in terms of foods and dietary things that I'm putting in my body in terms of what level of rest I might need, um, what level of exercise I might need, just paying attention, right? I mean, for me, my body is creating all of these, you know, hydro, hydrogen extra, you know, hydro, hydro peroxide, <laughs> I'm not getting the word right. I have a lot of superoxides that my body is overproducing. So, the general rule is, oh, you should exercise, right? Exercise is good for you. Well, when the, Dr. Bob says, okay, for you, you could be running into this, where when you exercise, you end up with all of this extra superoxide, so you actually feel 10 times worse when you exercise, and it's actually much worse for your body for you to do it. Um, so I think we tend to take other people's recommendations for us and we, we should ourselves, oh, I should exercise, oh, I should do this, I should, oh, I should eat that healthy food that I hate the taste of. I hate garlic and onions. And you know what? I finally found out recently that I don't um, clear those well. <laughs> so I'm like, that's why I stay away from them. And so listening to our bodies, I think, is a huge way that we can kind of pay attention to what it needs. Sometimes cravings can really help us understand when we're, you know, missing out on an important nutrient or something that we might be deficient in. So that's, that's my answer on testing. It's probably convoluted and long, but it's, testing is not black and white to me. Can it be helpful? It can be in some instances. Can it cause people uh, distress and can it cause them to spend a lot of money on trying to buy a lot of things that may or may not help it can do that as well so it, it uh, I think it's a double-edged sword and you have to use it like anything else with a, a sense of balance and understanding 
intuitively what's right for you and your needs.